good morning to each of you. So glad you decided to join us here at Bayside Blue Oaks. We're grateful that you showed up here as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Whether this is your church home or if you're brand new here, we're so grateful for you. If you're watching online this morning, we're thankful for you as well. Can we get up for those who are brand new around here, our first time guests for showing up to church today. Also want to say thank you to so much for those who are uh, here in church in the park uh, this morning. There are so many people who have gathered here to hear as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, J uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, for those of you who are brand new, my name is Jason Kane. I'm one of the pastors here at Bayside Blue Oaks. Get to serve this community. Get to share God's word with you this morning. Um, a friend of mine back in Atlanta texted me this morning, uh, and he asked me this question. I show up on the screen. It said, you preaching? And I told him, yes, sir. Uh, I was expecting that he was going to say, uh, man, I'm praying for you this morning, thinking about you, hope you do well. Uh, but this was his next response. He said, make sure you don't go too long, people be hungry. Uh, so that was the advice I got from my friend, people be hungry. Uh, and I know y'all want to get to brunch or wherever you're going, so I promise I won't preach for too long today. <laughs> uh, but my friend Tyler, thank you so much for the encouraging message uh, right before church. Uh, uh, somebody else pointed out last service that I have 426 unread text messages and that gave them the heebie-jeebies. Uh, those are just text messages telling me about my car's extended warranty. Uh, they're trying to get in contact with me. Uh, but anyway, let's get into the word. Uh, we're going to be in Luke, chap excuse me, Mark chapter 16 today. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. Mark chapter 16. Mark is one of four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospels tell the story of Jesus' life while he's on earth. And Mark tells it from a perspective where he goes kind of rapid fire through the life of Jesus. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, it says this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise... They were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? They're concerned about how they're going to get in the tomb to see Jesus, verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You were looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. I promise y'all, some people don't know what to celebrate when you read scripture. Jesus, who they crucified and they thought was dead, so they show up to the scene and the angel tells them that he is risen. Really, that's enough of a message today, that Jesus is not in the tomb, but he is risen indeed. He said, he is not here. See the place where they lay, laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. I'll give you verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out. And fled from the tomb. They said nothing to one, to anyone, because they were afraid. Each Easter, we retell the story, we retell, excuse me, the event that changed the world forever, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reason I say event and not story is because it's not some made-up story made up in a fictional book, but it's a book or an actual event that happened in history, Jesus indeed raised from the dead. This morning, I want to shine a spotlight not just on the resurrection of Jesus, but also look at what happened during the week that led up to his death, burial, and resurrection. This week for Jesus was one that was full of ups and downs. It was a roller coaster of a week. And the example that Jesus sets for us is when things are up and down in life, continue to trust God's plan. We celebrate this week as a holy week. We celebrate this week because we know at the end of this week, our Savior would be risen from the dead but the early disciples had no idea how this week would end. I mean, this is one of the most trying weeks of their lives and of Jesus' life. Have you ever had a trying week? Have you ever experienced a series of days that left you emotionally spent, psychologically broken, and physically beat down? Have you ever had a season in your life that was a roller coaster of emotions and trials? You're thinking, man, I ain't had a week, I've had a lifetime. The last week of Jesus' life, known as Holy Week, gives us what we celebrate, but for Jesus, it was a trying week. Before we celebrate the resurrection, this is what I want to do today. I want us to take time and look at the final week of Jesus' life, day by day, to give us a fuller understanding of the context of the resurrection. Let's go day by day. We'll start with seven days prior to Jesus' death, excuse me, on that Sunday. On Sunday, Jesus goes into Jerusalem, and he's headed there to celebrate what is known as the Passover. 
As he enters into the city, Scott talked about this last week. He rode onto a donkey. Crowds of people came out. They sung Hosanna. They were excited about who Jesus was. They were excited that their Savior was showing up on the scene because they believed that Jesus was coming to conquer the Romans so that they could live the life that they wanted and they would no longer have to be under Roman rule and oppression. But the people that celebrate him on Sunday would shout crucify him on Friday. Listen, Jesus shows us that we have to be more concerned about following God's plan than pleasing people. These people received him on Sunday but rejected him on Friday. They honored him on Sunday but they hated him on Friday. They celebrated him as a hero on Sunday but on Friday they crucified him as a heretic. Listen, they did this because Jesus' agenda didn't match their agenda. Their expectations of Jesus and what they actually got from Jesus did not go together. It was a contradiction, and this contradiction caused them to say, I'm no longer going to follow you or trust you or sing your praises. I'm going to abandon you and live the life that I want. Have you been there in your life before that what you thought Jesus was going to do for you, he didn't do? That he didn't heal your sick family member? That he didn't give you the job you want? That you were disappointed because you didn't get what you want? And oftentimes people walk away when Jesus does not give them what they want. But listen, the reason we follow Jesus isn't because he gives us everything we want, it's because he's been everything we need, which is a savior to save us from our sins. Don't walk away from Jesus when things get tough. Stay close to him and trust him in the hard times. Listen, we got to have more than a mentality that says, I'm going to follow Jesus as long as things are perfect, as long as I can make the rules, as long as I'm comfortable, as long as it matches what I want for my life. Follow Jesus at all times. That was Sunday. On Monday, we read about the account in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 19, that Jesus leaves a place called Bethany, and he takes a two-mile journey to the epicenter of the city, and he's going to the temple. As he's walking to the temple with his disciples, off in the distance, he sees a fig tree. This fig tree was full of leaves, indicating that it would have fruit on it that would be ripe. Jesus walks up to this fig tree, he begins to look for figs or look for the fruit, and there's no fruit on this fig tree. This fig tree was fruitless. It had foliage, the appearance on the outside that something was growing on the inside. On the outside, it was beautiful, but on the inside, it could offer and produce nothing. On the outside, it looked as if it could give Jesus something that he desired, but on the inside, it was completely empty and barren. And Jesus curses that fig tree to his disciples. And when you look at this account, you're wondering, what is this all about? This is what it's about. As a church and as individuals who follow after Jesus, we don't just want to have the appearance of following Jesus, but we want to have the substance of following Jesus. We don't just want to say out loud that we follow Jesus and we trust him and we love him. We want to demonstrate it with our lives. Is your life, if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus producing fruit? Have you made a commitment that you're not going to be more concerned with looking the part Then you are with sharing Jesus' heart. Listen, believers, in today's world, in a world that's full of trial and stress, in a world that needs Jesus never like never before, it's a shame that we make more time worried about what our outside is than what our inside is. We got to make sure that we are Jesus from the inside out so that when people encounter us, they'll be encouraged. When people encounter us, they'll encounter forgiveness and love and grace. Is your life producing fruit? Jesus was upset. Because the tree never intended to be what it pretended to be. Let's make sure that we aren't pretenders, but we are people who are producing fruit daily. As Jesus continues his journey, he makes it to the temple. When he gets to the temple, he's shocked by what he sees. He sees money changers taking advantage of people. He sees people being uh, corrupted from the inside out. He sees inside the temple where the holy things are supposed to happen, that people are doing all they can to push their own agenda, to pad their own pockets, to do what they want instead of do what God wants. And Jesus, in his anger, begins to flip over the tables and he chases the money changers out of the temple. And he says that my house will be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. Church, shame on us if we allow this place to become a den den of thieves. Shame on us if we're more concerned with what church can do for us than with what we can do for our community. I'm thankful that our church is more concerned with looking out for the needs of others, and we don't just look that way, but we live that way. The church has to stand up and be everything that God has called it to be in this cultural moment so that others can experience the love, grace, and mercy of Jesus Christ. Let's make sure that we reach wide, that we teach deep, that we unleash compassion in the world because that's what we've been called to do. People 
people of justice and grace and mercy. Let's be who Jesus has called us to be. Amen. Understand, many people, as they grow older, begin to walk away from the church because they've experienced some level of church hurt. And if you're here this morning and you don't go to church because you say the church is full of hypocrites, or you left the church because someone in the church hurt you, I want to let you know, please don't allow people to keep you from Jesus. Because he's lo he loves you and he'll be gracious to you. And we're doing the best we can. And we're going to fall sometimes and we're not always going to do it the right way. But I thank God for his forgiveness and for his grace. If you've been away for a while, thank you so much for having the willingness to return and come back. That's Monday. On Tuesday, something interesting happened. Jesus tested and put on public trial by three different groups of people, and all these groups of people are religious leaders. You can find this account in Mark chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. He encounters the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. The Pharisees ask Jesus about paying taxes. Now, in this society, there were the Romans who were over all of society, and then you had the Jewish religious leaders who ran another segment of society but had to be under the authority of the Romans. They could only do what the Romans allowed. So these Pharisees come to Jesus in an attempt to try to track him, to put him on trial and say, should we be paying the imperial tax? Now, as Californians, we should want the answer to this question. Do we need to pay our taxes? <laughs> Let us know, Jesus. And they're trying to trap Jesus because if Jesus says you don't have to pay your taxes, he would have immediately been arrested, taken, and crucified in that moment. And it was not yet time for that to happen. So Jesus says, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. In other words, I'm sorry, y'all, pay your taxes. The deadline's tomorrow. <laughs> he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, but render to God the things that are God. In other words, pay your taxes, but make sure that you give your heart fully to God. Then the Sadducees come to Jesus with another question that makes no sense. They come to Jesus and they say uh, to him, if a woman dies, Moses says, excuse me, not if a woman died, if a man dies and he's married, that his wife is supposed to marry his brother. That was what, the norm for that society during that time because the brother would take care of the wife. They says, what if that happens and seven times the man dies and she remarries seven times, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Now there's something you gotta know about the Sadducees. The Sadducees theologically didn't even believe in a resurrection for all people. They didn't believe in that at all. But they are asking Jesus a question, not because they wanna know the answer, but because they want to trick him and they want to trap him the best that they can. Hey, y'all, we have to make sure that we use wisdom when some people want to argue with us things that they don't even believe. Don't get caught in those arguments. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection yet, and still they asked about it. They thought that this life was all the life that they had. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So they were sad, you see. <laughs> I'm going to resurrect that joke every single Easter, every single Easter. Jesus responds to them and says, hey, the relationship on earth is not the one that matters. That's not the most significant one. The one that matters is the fact that they are a son or a daughter of God. And in heaven, in the kingdom, in eternity, they will know who they belong to and they'll have a perfect relationship. Jesus is essentially saying the relationships here on earth, while they have significance here, do not usurp the relationship that we will have with our heavenly father. I thank God that in heaven we won't be married to one another, but we will be connected to our heavenly father and we will see him every day and he will take care of us because we are his sons and daughters, and that relationship will never, ever cease. <laughs> then a scribe comes and says, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was able to survive these trials and these questions because he stood on the truth. And when we have trials in life, the thing that will help us withstand trials is to stand on the truth of God's word. And trials come in a variety of ways. But you got to stand on God's truth. You might have a trial right now where you're going through a difficult season and your money is funny and your change is strange and you don't know what to do. Listen, hold on to the truth that says my God will supply all of my needs. You might be going through a trial thinking, man, I'll never recover from the loss of this job. Remember this truth from God's scripture and we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God and who are called according to his purpose. You might be facing the trial of feeling lost and abandoned. You got to remember that the Lord is your shepherd and he is standing right there with you. You might feel like you're alone and in darkness, but the truth is the Lord is your light and your salvation. You might have a diagnosis and you might be on your way to death and you only got six months to live, but I want you to know the, tr the truth that 
that you got to hold on to is to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Whether we live or perish, we have gained something in Jesus Christ. Stand on the truth of God's word when you face trials, and God's word will hold you up. Anybody trust God's word this morning? <laughs> on Wednesday in Mark chapter 14, the gospel writers are really inconclusive about what Jesus did on Wednesday. But what we do know happened on Wednesday is that on Wednesday, Judas goes to the religious leaders and authorities and he sets Jesus up. He betrays Jesus. Now, I always have a problem when I read about Judas because Judas walked with Jesus for three years. And what's amazing to me is you can be around Jesus but not be like Jesus. If you can't say amen, say ouch. <laughs> you can show up for church every single week, even serve and not be like Jesus. But this is what I love about Jesus' relationship with Judas is that Jesus shows his love even toward Judas. If you walked in here this morning, you're feeling like an outcast right now, you're feeling abandoned, you're thinking all the people in this room are perfect, they got it all together, they got on their Sunday best, they look sharp, they probably don't have any issues, I want you to know that all of us have some sort of issue, and in spite of our issues, Jesus still loves us. If he can love Judas, who would betray him and send him to the cross, he can love you in whatever mess you've got in your life. I thank God that his love supersedes any problem and any character trait and any flaw and any sin in my life. Jesus loves you just like you are, and he will change your life to be much better. On that Wednesday, what we do know is Jesus was in a place called Bethany. And in Bethany lived three of his closest friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lazarus, the one he had rose from the dead. So it's safe to assume that while Jesus was in Bethany that he stopped by to see his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. On the most hectic week of his life, and in the most trying week of his life, Jesus pauses for enough time to spend some time with some close friends. Listen, y'all. You better have some good community in this life, and you better not try to do life on your own because if Jesus needed friends, you need friends alone. I, you need friends as well. I know you might be thinking, I can do life alone. I can't trust anybody. But all of us need trusted friends in a community of believers so that in trial, they can take time to pray for us and to lift us up and to encourage us. I thank God that I'm part of a community of believers that when I face trials, I don't have to face them alone, but I can let y'all know what's happening in my life. And many of you have prayed for me and look at after me and encourage me. And hopefully, if you're a part of this community, you've experienced that same love as well. Don't live this Christian life alone. Live it in community. I mean, if Jesus needed friends, certainly you need some friends as well. Thursday, Jesus is coming to his final full day on earth. He sits down with his disciples to celebrate the Passover, and he converts it to give it brand new meaning, to change it to the Lord's Supper. He says, as you sit down and have this meal in the future, I want you to remember me until I come again. But then Jesus does something interesting. After he leaves the Lord's Supper with his disciples, he goes to a garden, a place called Gethsemane. And he knows what he came to the earth to do, to die. And as he is in that garden, Jesus has a moment of humanity and vulnerability that we cannot miss. The trial that he was facing was so great fact that he had to go lay down his life was such a difficult task that he prayed for God to take away that burden. Have you ever been there where you faced a burden or faced a difficulty or faced a trial that was so large that you begged and pleaded for God to take it away? Man, this relationship, Lord, is so hard, I don't know what to do. This job is so hard, I don't know what to do. This child that I have to raise is so difficult to raise them, I don't know what to do. Have you ever been at your wit's end where you said, God, please take it away? But what Jesus teaches us is sometimes suffering is just part of the process. And when you follow Jesus, it doesn't give you a pass on the trials of life. Sometimes following Jesus means that you are signing up for trials. And Jesus does not want to have to face this trial. He does not want to have to go to the cross. But he prays this prayer in Mark chapter 14, verse 35 and 36. Going a little further, he fell down on the ground and prayed, if it's possible that the hour might pass, Lord, let me not do this. Verse 36, Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. God, can't you do something about the sickness? Get it out of my life. Can't you do something about what I'm experiencing? Let it pass. But then Jesus says these words, yet not what I will, but what you will. 
It's okay to pray for trials to pass you by, but at the end of the day, we have to get to the point where we say, Lord, not my way, but your way. And Jesus understood this principle. He said, Lord, if it's possible, let this pass for me. And God said no, and Jesus had to go to the cross for you and I. It wasn't what he would have wanted, but it's exactly what God had planned. And sometimes your plans will contradict God's plans. And when that happens, always make sure you go with God's plans. Because if God would have let Jesus out of that, then me and you wouldn't be in a relationship with him right now. But I thank God that Christ was obedient even unto death so that you and I could experience the forgiveness and the relationship that we have with God. Make sure that when you pray for God to let things pass that you say, not my will away, but yours be done. Friday shows up. Jesus is crucified. And we are all familiar with that. Why did Jesus have to be crucified? Why was this the way that he had to go? Three reasons. He had to be crucified. So scripture would be fulfilled. Throughout the Old Testament, there was scripture that was given about the Messiah. There was prophecies that were given over and over and over again about the Messiah. And so in order to fulfill scripture, Jesus had to be crucified. Psalm 22, 1 says this, the Savior would be forsaken by God. On the cross, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That fulfills scripture. In Isaiah 53, 12, we read that, The Messiah would be crucified with criminals, and that's exactly what happened. He was crucified with two criminals on his side. Psalm 22, 16 says the Messiah would be pierced in his hands and feet, and that's exactly what happened. Christ in being crucified fulfilled scripture. But in being crucified, he also sympathized with his followers. He sympathized with his followers. If you think that the pain that you're experiencing in your life, that Christ can't relate to it, he literally died on the cross. Hebrews 4, 15 says this, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Even in our weaknesses, Christ can sympathize with us. If you think nobody can relate to what you're going through, if you think that there's nobody on your side, if you think that there's nothing that this world can offer, I want you to know that Christ sympathizes with you. The third reason he had to be crucified was to secure our forgiveness. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And every time Jesus was on that cross, while he was on that cross shedding blood, our sins were forgiven. Jesus died a bloody death. He bled when they put a crown of thorns on his head. He bled when they pierced him in his side. He bled when they put nails in his hand and nails in his feet. Jesus died a bloody death, but every single drop of blood that came from the body of Christ became a drop of blood that was used to forgive our sins sins. I thank God that Christ was crucified. Friday, Jesus hangs his head and he dies. He pays the price for our sin on that cross. Saturday rolls around and Saturday is a hopeless day. His disciples that had followed him for three and a half years are keenly aware of the fact that it looks as if there is no hope to be found. They were with Jesus for three years thinking that he is going to be the Messiah, that he's going to triumphantly defeat our enemies. They're scattered about. The disciples are afraid, thinking they probably would face the same fate as Christ. Saturday was a hopeless day. Imagine that you're one of those early disciples. You've been going around with Jesus all this time, seeing him walk on water seeing him give sight to the blind, teach these wonderful messages, but in an instant, he is dead. Death has a finality to it that will make you cry for days. Have you ever lost a loved one? Death is final. Death is difficult. Death is hard. Death is painful. But death was never the plan that God had for us. That's why death makes us grieve so much because it was not something that we were ever equipped to handle. Death is a terrible thing to experience. Death makes you experience loss like you were never prepared to experience. His disciples had no hope. They weren't at the tomb expecting him to resurrect. None of them were there like five, four, three, two, one. Happy Easter, he's back. No, they were scattered and afraid. But then one Sunday morning, the darkness turned to light. The hopelessness turned into hope. 
and the world was forever changed because Christ resurrected from the dead. Nobody expected it, and it changed everything. The reason you and I are here today is because Christ rose from the dead. The hopelessness of Saturday was eclipsed by the hope of resurrection on Sunday. I thank God that Christ rose from the dead. He is risen indeed. Now, I know in a crowd of this size, and perhaps you're watching online, that there are some of you who are skeptical of the resurrection. And that is okay. I'm glad that you're watching. I'm glad that you're here. There have been thousands and hundreds of thousands of pages written on the resurrection of Jesus. And I want to encourage you to pick up my friend's book, Mark Clark. He wrote a book called The Problem of Jesus where he tackles the problem of the resurrection. But what is the proof that we have? Let me give you very four practical Evidences of the resurrection. The first is the absent body. If Jesus did not raise from the dead, then where is the body? In the first century, it would have been easy for the Romans to find the body and quickly say, hey, y'all are talking about a man who resurrected. Here he is right here. He's dead in the tomb. But the Romans could not find a body because there was no body, (laughs) y'all. They were great at killing folks and keeping them dead and protecting the tomb. And the body was not stolen. The Romans knew how to protect a body. There was no body because Jesus resurrected from the dead and there's no body to be found. His body is absent. Another practical evidence of the resurrection is the abundant witnesses. He showed himself to over 500 of his disciples. And people could go to them and have one-on-one conversations with him. Also, what do the antagonists of Jesus say? People who wouldn't care about his resurrection. Josephus, a first century historian, you should read what he has to say about Jesus. But the biggest evidence for the resurrection is the apostles' lives, the disciples, those who followed Jesus. Remember, when Jesus dies, they're nowhere to be found. They're actually locked behind the door in the upper room. They are afraid of what might happen to them. But for some reason, they go from being afraid to being out in the open in public about Jesus' resurrection. For some reason, they go from being scared And timid to speaking up and starting the biggest movement ever to see the world. What changed for the disciples? What changed for the disciples was this. They saw the resurrected Jesus. And when you see a man who is dead come back to life, you will live for that man the rest of your life because you know giving your life to him is worth it. The disciples' lives were changed because they experienced a resurrected Lord. And today I want you to know that if you experience the resurrected Jesus, you don't have a choice but to make your life change because Christ has risen from the dead. Theologian Mike Lacona said this, after Jesus' death, the disciples endured persecution and a number of them experienced martyrdom. They were willing to die. The strength of their conviction indicates that they were not just claiming Jesus had appeared to them after rising from the dead. They really believed it and they willingly endangered themselves by publicly proclaiming that he is risen. If you have your notes, I want to give you these things to write in real quick because I know some of you won't sleep tonight if you don't have these fill-ins. So let me give them to you. The resurrection reminds us of three things. The first is, what a mess. The world was in an absolute mess. Do you know that everything that's bad that's a part of this world is because of sin? Everything that's bad, cancer because of sin. Robbery and thievery and murder because of sin. Separation of families, sin. War, the result of sin. Raiders fans, sin. Niners quarterbacks, sin. Listen, the world is a mess. All you have to do is look around and you can see that the world is an absolute mess. And a messy world needs a Messiah that's willing to clean up the mess. And that Messiah is Jesus. The thing about Christianity that makes it different from every other religion is that we don't clean ourselves up. Our Savior has cleaned cleaned us up. What a mess. Resurrection always reminds us of this. What a God. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we read this, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. When we were lost and when our world was a mess, God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. What a God. The resurrection should remind you that God loves you so much that he did everything to find you so that he could save you. I thank God that God finds lost people and saves them so they can have brand new life. You are valuable to God and you matter to God and he loves you and he'll do anything to find you. Uh, Our production pastor here at the church, his name is Dan. Uh, And a couple of weeks ago, Dan's AirPods went missing here at the church. 
And he asked us, had any of us seen his AirPods? And, of course, none of us had seen our Air, his AirPods because they were his AirPods and we didn't know where they were. So Dan uses an app that's on your iPhone called Find My. And the next day, he discovers that his AirPods are somewhere in Citrus Heights. So he texts me and says, hey, Jason, I'm going to go to Citrus Heights to go get my AirPods. And I said, hey, man, don't get shot. We need you for Easter. <laughs> so he uses a map on the phone, takes him right to Citrus Heights. He's at an apartment complex, can't tell which three apartments that his AirPods are in. He texts me, he's like, I'm leaving. I don't know what to do. Later on that day, he pins me, hey, Jason, my AirPods are at TJ Maxx off Douglas Boulevard. I'm like, man, please do not go to TJ Maxx off Douglas Boulevard looking for your AirPods. This person stole AirPods from a church. You think they care about your life? <laughs> Dan being Dan goes to TJ Maxx, not shopping for clothes, looking for his AirPods, pinging them, and he walks next to a lady, and is pinging, and he knows she has them. And he says, hey, ma'am, how are you doing? God bless you. Did you happen to find some AirPods? And she says, I don't have no idea what you're talking about. He's like, well, I'm looking here on the map. They say you have them. She's like, I don't have them. And thankfully, Dan walked away. Praise God. <laughs> then later on that day, AirPods are pinged again in Citrus Heights. He texts me, I'm going to Citrus Heights to get my AirPods. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I'll just buy you a new pair. It ain't worth your life. <laughs> Goes back to Citrus Heights, finds the car that they're in, starts following the car. I'm like, oh, my goodness. <sighs> they cost $250. They're on sale for $179. That's worth your life, Dan. <laughs> Rolls up on the car. <laughs> Dan is a gangster, y'all. You better be careful. <laughs> the person rolls down the window, reaches their hand out the window, and hands Dan his AirPods. Dan was recounting this story, and I was thinking to myself, what is wrong with Dan? <laughs> then my preacher mind jumped in the gear, because everything's got to turn into sermon. And I realized this, that the same way that Dan was hunting down his AirPods is the same way that God hunts us down. that we were lost in this world all on our own to ourselves, roaming around the world, and the whole time our Father knew exactly where we were and at different times in your life, He has encountered you, and you might not surrender then, and you might not surrender later, but at some point you will surrender. And Dan was looking for his AirPods because AirPods have value. And while those AirPods have value, the value is not enough for him to lose his life. But your value in your life is so much that Christ was willing to give up his life so that he can find you. I thank God that Christ gave up his life so that I could be found and you could be found and our lives could be transformed and we could be much different because Christ loves us enough to die for us then our lives will never be the same. So this morning, my question for you. Is will you surrender to God? He's chased you down to this moment right here so that you would surrender your life to him. And you can run today and you can say like that lady said, I ain't surrendering right now. But like Dan, he will keep on searching and keep on seeking because he loves you too much to leave you right where you are. He wants to change you and transform you. And when you follow Christ, what a mess, what a God, but what a difference Jesus makes in your life. Can anybody testify this morning that since you follow Jesus, he's made a difference in your life, that you got more peace and you got more joy and you got more love in your life. And I want you to know that Christ wants to give you eternal life. Listen, what a shame it would be. For you to live your life and hear the gospel and not respond to it. Christ has something better for you than you have for yourself. Doesn't mean it's without trial. Doesn't mean that it's without trouble. But what it does mean is that he's got eternity set for you in a place called heaven where you'll walk on streets that are paved with gold. There'll be no more crying and no more suffering and no more tears and no more death and no more separation from God and no more war and no more conflict and no more problems. It is a perfect place for prepared people and he's prepared a place for you. Will you say yes to him today? Bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you. That you never stop the search for us. Lord, I thank you that you'll leave the one, the 99 to find the one. And whoever that one is this morning, Father, I pray that they would surrender their lives to you. 
If that's you this morning, you've never given your life to Christ. You want to make that decision today. You want to surrender. Just simply repeat this prayer after me. There's no magic in this prayer, but this prayer is you verbally saying that I'm giving my life to you today, Jesus. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm asking you to save me. I believe your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross and rose from the dead. Thank you for finding me when I did not know I was lost. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Come on, can we celebrate those that gave their lives to Christ this morning?